Psalm 103. It's good to see you gathered out this morning in God's house. We're going to worship the Lord by singing the words of Psalm 103. Found in the page 94. Familiar words, no doubt. No, O thou my soul, bless God the Lord and all that in me is. Be stirred up his holy name to magnify and bless. The Psalm 103, we'll sing from the verse 1. And we'll sing down to the verse 7 of this great psalm. The Psalm 103, and after the note, we'll stand, please, to sing. our meeting, having rendered our psalm of praise. The Lord says, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And now we're going to pray again a declaration of God's glory. Our Father, we come to thee afresh this morning in the lovely and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. His name to us, Lord, is as ointment poured forth. And we thank thee that we can say today, Jesus, my Saviour, is precious to me. Unto you, therefore, that believe, he is precious. We believe him to be the pearl of great price. We remember, Lord, how the dealer in the Bible, in the parable, that man, that merchant man sought out the pearl of great price. And when he had found it, he went and he sold all that he had in order that he might obtain it for himself. And we can say, Lord, this morning concerning thy Son and our Saviour, ten thousand charms around him shine, but best of all, I know he's mine. We thank you, Father, for bringing us today to the house of God. We thank you for the Sabbath day. We still hold store by the observation of the Sabbath day. We are to remember the Sabbath. We are to keep it holy. 
And we're thankful, Father, that in thy wisdom, even from the very beginning of time, for it is a creation ordinance, a creation uh, matter that thou didst ordain, that the day would be set aside. And we're glad, Lord, that we can come to the house of God. We remember the words of the psalmist who said that he was pleased, he was glad when they said unto him, let us go up to the house of the Lord. And that's our feeling this morning. We're glad to be among the Lord's people, people of a like precious faith. Here, Lord, the saints can meet together and edify one another and encourage one another. It would be a bad day, Lord, if we were to meet here and to come aside afterwards and not in any way be encouraged or edified in our faith. Lord, we pray today that we might have a great sense of your presence with us. We have come primarily, Lord, to meet with thee. It's the Lord who draws us here. We want to hear the voice of the shepherd speaking to us, the flock. And Lord, we're praying much even to that end, that we might hear thy voice, the voice of our beloved. Remember the needs, Lord, of the congregation here. We Thank you for the many years of uh, faithful witness in this rural part of County Down. Thank you, Lord, that over the years Christ has been preached, souls have been saved, the people of God discipled, built up in their most holy faith. And we pray that that might ever be, uh, Lord, the, the pattern of the church, that it might ever be its goal to have a God-glorifying witness in the community here. Remember the sick of the congregation this morning. We would pray for them that they might know the hand of the Lord upon them, the, la the hand of the Lord to heal. We were singing, Lord, even those words this morning, Lord, how you heal all our diseases. And we're praying that that'll be the case this morning, that you might relieve pain where pain is being felt and take away discomfort and Lord, that they might know that thou art their helper this morning. Remember those that have been bereaved, maybe in recent times, or maybe some anniversary has come round, as they're wont to do. And again, maybe there's a heavy heart this morning. Maybe there's one Lord who has shed tears already today. Well, we would pray our power for them. Lord, one of your titles is the God of all comfort. And may you show yourself to be such, even unto those, Lord, who are brokenhearted, even at this time. And there's always, Lord, who are carrying great burdens. There's always, Lord, maybe with problems they cannot share with another, even, Lord, close friends. Well, we're glad that we can bring them to thee. There's one, Lord, who says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer thee. But oh, today our Father meet every need. Remember our country at this time. Oh God, we are in a mess. We, we believe it's a mess largely, Lord, of our own doing. The Lord, for years we heard that there was an awful harvest coming. The seeds that were being sown were not good seeds. There would be a harvest. And now, Lord, we believe that we're seeing the harvest. And what a harvest it is. Lord, we are a weak people in a number of ways, and even in relation to influence in so many ways. There's ungodly laws being brought in, even over our heads. Lord, what can we do today? But we cry to thee. We pray, Lord, that you'll raise up for our help. Fain indeed is the help of man. And Lord, it's better to trust in the Lord and to put confidence in man. Better to put trust in the Lord even than to put confidence in princes. And therefore, Lord, we pray that you will rise up for our help and show thyself strong on behalf of all who fear thy name. But with us now, Lord, we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our Saviour, and our Redeemer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Our reading this morning is found in uh, the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. And it's a chapter 5 this morning. And we're going to read from the verse 1. And we'll finish our reading at the verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5 this morning, commencing our reading, the verse 1 and reading down to the verse 14. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you, as becometh a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. And of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Amen. May God bless and honour the public reading of his own precious word. I'm going to ask our brother Andrew. Andrew, can you come please and bring the announcements for the incoming week. Thank you. Thank you. The Sabbath day with you and what the Lord has to say to us through you. The gospel service tonight is at 7 p.m. as usual, preceded by the time of prayer at 6.30. And if you can be in your place at the time of prayer, but certainly be in your place at the gospel service at 7 p.m., please. <clears throat> Tuesday night is, as usual, the gospel bus meeting for the boys and girls at 7 p.m. Again, continue to pray for this work and continue to pray that others, new children, will be brought in in the days uh, that lie before us. Wednesday is the prayer meeting at 8 p.m. And in the absence of the Reverend Henderson, the Reverend Andrew Murray from our Dara Free Presbyterian Church, will be taking the prayer meeting. The service is next Lord's Day, 12 noon, is the morning worship, as usual, preceded by the time of prayer in the church hall at 11.30. The evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by the time of prayer at 6.30 in the hall as well. And in the will of the Lord, the Reverend Henderson will be back with us after his time of holiday. Today is the maintenance fund offering as you leave, and next Sunday is the retiring missionary offering. Do continue to pray for those that are unable to be with us, those that are shut in, those that are unwell, and those especially who in recent uh, days have suffered bereavement or in recent weeks, and continue to pray for all those who are unable to be with us for whatever reason. Um, 
And of course, all of these announcements are subject to the mind and will of the Lord. Thank you. Well, thank you, brother, for bringing the announcements and also for the warm words of welcome. And it is good to be back with you again here in Money Slain. It's not that long ago I was here for a deputation meeting just maybe a couple of months ago. And uh, we were really encouraged with the, the prayers and the generosity of the Lord's people. And uh, please continue to remember us in prayer. This past week we were down in Dublin and uh, joined up with some folk down there. And we had a good time in open air preaching just there at O'Connell Street. And this week, God willing, uh, we will be heading down to Knox Shrine again for the witness outside the gates uh, there. Uh, the month of July has been a very wet month. And when you're outside in evangelism, of course, you're forever looking at clouds. Nowadays, we look at little apps. And I have two apps on the go. I have Matt Aaron. Uh, you think they would know maybe a lot better than the, the, the English folk, uh, uh, the Met Office, but I have two of them going and sometimes they, they match up and other times they don't. There's a lot of little dark clouds about this month of July and it has a hampering effect upon the work, but sometimes you just have to get on with it. And uh, so please remember uh, those efforts in prayer and thank you for your prayers. 317 is going to be our offering hymn. 317. Behold what love, what boundless love the Father hath bestowed on sinners lost that we should be now called the sons of God. 317. Remain seated and uh, the collection will be taken up for the work of God here in Money Slain. 317 found in page 304. <laughs>
on for verse 2 again, no longer far from him but now, my precious. Let's turn back again, please, to the word of the Lord that we read together. We read in Ephesians chapter 5 and the first 14 verses. My text this morning is found in the words of the verse 1, the opening verse. And here we have the, the simple exhortation of the apostle to this church at Ephesus. He said, Be ye therefore followers of of God as dear children. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Let's seek the Lord again in prayer. Heavenly, <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for these hymns of praise. We thank thee that God's people, as the hymn writer put it, the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing. You've put a new song in our mouth, even praise unto our God. You think of one Lord who wrote the words and said, I sing, for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. And Lord, having offered our hymns of praise, Lord, we're turning our eyes afresh to the word of God. Lord, help us as we read the scriptures. Give us an ear to hear, Lord, what you're saying to us. I need thy power to preach the word. The arm of flesh, Lord, will surely fail. And I dare not trust my own. But, Lord, I trust in thee today. If we be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto our children. How much more does our heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask of him? And that's what we're doing this morning, Lord. We're just asking for the help of the Spirit of God. Let your word have free course, Lord, and be glorified. Give us all an ear to hear. I am listening, Lord, to thee. What hast thou to say to me? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, words of verse 1, our text this morning. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Very few people get to be pioneers. Trailblazers are hard to find. And those who find themselves in that rarefied company are often remembered and honoured. It was Christopher Columbus who is credited with the discovery of America in 1492, it was Scott who went to the Antarctic. It was Edwin, Edmund Hillary, the New Zealander, who climbed and scaled Everest, the first man ever to do so. And then, of course, Neil Armstrong. He went further than them all and walked on the moon. The rest of us are left to follow in the steps of ours, to tread what we might describe as well-worn paths. And we might never be pioneers. But we're geographical like these people we have mentioned, or maybe on some other field, like medicine, or technology, or philosophy. And in our, in our text this morning, we're not asked to be a pioneer. We're just being asked to follow, to follow. We may suppose that the pioneer enjoys a large degree of adventure. To go uh, where no man, to go boldly where no man has gone before sounds very exciting. 
But I think this morning that our instruction that we have here in our text is no less exciting. You think about Abraham to go way back early on in the Bible at the call of God, the naked call of God by faith in that call. Abraham went out not knowing well or soever he went. The ultimate mystery tour. The Lord just pointed him in a direction, told him to keep walking. And so he did. And uh, he did not go out on a whim, but he went out as a follower of God. The children of Israel, they didn't know where they were going when they left Egypt. They were going to the promised land. And again, even though they knew where they were going, you cannot but read that story in Exodus without discerning the drama of the whole occasion. So we cannot expect this morning, if we're God's people, and I'm putting the if in there, don't take that as something that is automatically. The Bible says to be a child of God, of course, we need to be born again, born into the family of God. But we cannot expect if we profess Christ to be stationary because the Lord is calling us in the text to be a follower, to get your walking boots on. We're going somewhere, or we ought to be. Be ye followers of God as dear children. With very simply three points this morning that I trust will be easily remembered and that will take them all the heart the first thing that we have in our passage this morning, or in our text, drawer, is number one, we have the description. The description. How are we described? And it's, it's a lovely description, isn't it? It's a heartwarming description. We are described as dear children. It's the voice of our heavenly Father, isn't it? And he describes us as dear children. The word dear there is just the... Uh, old English word, or the Greek word, I should say, rather, akape. And you could translate that without in any despite. As it's often translated, we are dear or we are beloved children. We are the sons and daughters of his love. And this is how God chooses to describe you. And it shows the expression of his great heart towards his people. In Song of Solomon chapter 5, we have a little insight into the great heart of the love of God. We're changing slightly the metaphor, but the bride there was addressed by her divine lover. And he said unto her, Open to me, and then outpours all these terms of affection. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my own defiled. And isn't it wonderful, child of God this morning, that God looks at us and he looks with eyes of a blazing love towards us. He calls us his dear children. We need to remember that we are nothing in ourselves and uh, not merely neutral. We look back to a time we would word it before our conversion, before we were saved, that time when we were lost and we would have to say yes we were children but we were a different type of children in verse 6 there it, we would be described as being uh, the children of disobedience in Isaiah 30 verse 1 it says woe woe unto the rebellious children it's the same idea isn't it rebellion disobedience John 8, 44, the Savior had to say to us, ye were off your father, the devil. That's a very strong verse, isn't it? Spoke to religious people, to the Pharisees. Ye are off your father, the devil. It's possible to be religious and still be off your father, the devil. It's possible to be a, a Bible-carrying free Presbyterian membership of the church, still be a child of the devil. That's what we were before we were saved. And therefore, in Ephesians 2, in this very book in verse 3, Paul had to say, writing to the church at Ephesus, we were children of wrath, even as ours. 
We must therefore ask, well, whence came this great change? How can we go from being a child of wrath, a rebellious child? How can we go from that to be called the sons of God or as we have it here, dear children? And the reason for this is very simple this morning. We are viewed in Christ because of our union with him. In chapter 1, verse 6, we had it in the line of the second hymn there. We are accepted in the beloved. Colossians 2, verse 10 says, we actually stand complete with nothing missing, complete in him. Because the Lord did something for us, didn't he? Something that made all the difference. In verse 2, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, he also hath loved us and given himself for us. Remember what it says in the book of Hebrews? This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, your sins and mine, offered one sacrifice for sins, he sat down on the right hand of God. We are children of God, first of all, by, by regeneration. That's just the, 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 the nice theological word for being born again. To as many as received him, John chapter 1, still the way of salvation. How can I become a child of God? An unsaved man might ask. To as many as received him. To them he gave the power, the authority, the right to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, who were born. And this is where the regeneration steps in. When we receive him, that's our conversion. And the conversion is the fruit of our regeneration. Who were born not of God, or who were born not of blood, I, I should say, bit of a step there. Who were born not of blood. That is because of a family line. Mum and dad could be saved. Grand, grand is could be saved. But that doesn't mean to say that the son is saved or the grandchildren are saved. It's not of blood. It's not of the will of man. It's not of the will of the flesh. The Bible says we are born of God. It's a divine act upon the soul. It's supernatural. It's something outside the realm of nature. It is a divine intervention, an action from God. It is a new creation. That's how it's described. Remember the old creation. I remember reading about it in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. Out of nothing. And so it is with the new creation. The Lord says, let there be light and there is light. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's in the family of God by regeneration. And then the Bible talks about our adoption into the family of God. We should never mix the metaphors here, but there's different ways of looking at things. What is adoption? Well, the old catechism will come to our help here. Those that are schooled in their theology will, will know it. Adoption is an act of God's free grace. Again, it's a work of God or an act of God, God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. The sons of God. And when we've been born again, when we've been adopted, this enables God to truly call us his children, and not only his children, but his dearly, Beloved children, as such, of course, we are his dear children forever. Forever. None, none given by the Father to the Son will ever be lost. That's a tremendous truth, isn't it? Our heavenly Father, as Jesus taught us to address him, he feeds us, he clothes us, he directs us, he protects us, he secures our future. These are all the things that an earthly father would do for his child. If there's a failure here, uh, then there, there is a neglect somewhere. There's something that's gone wrong. But our heavenly father, how much more will your heavenly father do all these things? Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask of him. Child of God this morning, 
you ought to bask in your title as his, one of his dear children. Not in any Pharisaical way. I always think we ought to be very careful that we don't become Pharisees. And that, that's easy. There's always an extreme on either side. And uh, we've got to be balanced. But marvel this morning. Go home marveling in the sheer grace of God that today you can say, I am a child of God. As well as we were singing, those hymns picked themselves. Any preacher will tell you sometimes, although we have a great hymn book, you sit down the Sunday morning or whenever and you, you try and get a hymn and you turn from this hymn to that hymn and it can be hard to settle on a hymn. And then there's other times the hymns nearly pick themselves. Well, this hymn that we sang this morning picked itself, didn't it? Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. So that's the description that we have in our verse. And then I want us to notice number two here, and we're going down the alliteration road this morning. We have number two, the direction that is in our verse, because we are directed here to be a follower of God, a follower of God. There are those who sat store by the rule of the first mansion, and I decided that I would look that up to see where the word follow first appears in the Bible. And it's way back in Genesis chapter 24. So again, it's early on in the scriptures. And you remember how Abraham sent out his servant to find a bride for Isaac. Isaac was his son, his heir. And Isaac was, well, let's say past the teenage years now and uh, had not settled down for marriage. And Abraham was very concerned. So he had a servant who is, uh, remains unnamed for us, but he's just a servant. And he sent out Isaac, or he sent out the servant to look for a bride for Isaac. And the servant could see a potential problem because here is a man going out into a far country. And he's going to have to try and describe to a young lady whom he has never met to persuade her to come with him to marry a young man she has never met. There's no pictures, no photographs. There's nothing like that. And the servant saw the problem that we all could see. He said, peradventure, that's a lovely old English word. It just means it may be, perhaps, what if, what if, the woman, the woman will not be willing to follow me, to come with me and to meet Isaac. It's a constant command, isn't it, in Scripture? Get the concordance out when the Lord says, follow me. Matthew is sitting at the tax booth. Now, none of us hold great store and fondness for the tax man if you work for the tax office, you just tell everybody you're a civil servant and you can't tell them what, what you do. They all think you work for MI5, but that's a lot easier sometimes than working for the tax man. And they weren't very popular in those days either because you were working for the Romans and you didn't get on too good with your neighbours. And Matthew's sitting at the tax booth, probably a big Roman soldier beside him, protecting him. And the Lord just goes past. Matthew, follow me the effectual call of the gospel, follow me. And he got up, he left his booth, possibly the money as well, and he followed after him. Another man came to the Lord, he says, I, I, I want to follow you, but let me go first and bury my father, let the dead bury their dead. Come and follow me. And the Lord, of course, is well worth following this morning. I love that uh, verse of scripture that says, uh, Song 5, verse 16, that he is all together lovely. Mr. Newbury in his Bible has a lovely little note in the margin and he translates it or he renders it or he interprets it like this. He is perfect in all his parts. You see, every creature has its blemish, but not so our creator. Every attribute of God is perfect. In fact, God is the benchmark of all perfection. Be ye holy, 
as he is holy. And we ought to follow him wherever he leads us. Because there's one thing sure, he leads us into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we sang that Psalm 23 this morning, then we would have sung those words. He leads us into the paths of righteousness. It's the devil, it's Satan, the accuser, the tempter, who leads us into the paths of sin. But it's the Lord, as we are taught to pray, who delivers us from evil. And the follow is to go after him. It's to let him lead the way. So often that is a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? We get saved, we get enthusiasm, and we, we have got this maybe bit of go about us, and that's all good things, of course. But sometimes we want to lead. We want to rush out with a thought, well, the Lord's behind me. He's there as my, my kind of safety net. But that's not the way the Bible works. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And we've got to learn that it's the shepherd who leads the sheep. And the sheep follow him. And that's what we're called upon here to do. It's not the head strong that the Lord guides, but it's the meek. The psalmist said in Psalm 25, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. And when God leads his people, sometimes we sing that hymn, don't we? He leads his dear people along. He leads us onward. He leads us onward. Do you remember what the Lord commanded Moses? Speak, he says, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. We should not be static Christians. Don't be like the man in the, the job interview. He went in for the interview. He sat down. There's a little panel, four or five people. And he claimed to have five years' experience. And he said, Mr. So-and-so, that's what we're looking for. We just don't want a novice. We want someone with a lot of experience. And you tell us here, you have five years' experience. And they took him on. But then they discovered that he didn't have five years' experience. What he should have said is, I have one year's experience. And I've had one year's experience for five years. There's a big difference, isn't there? There's a massive difference. No, God's calling us this morning to go onward. We're pressing on the onward way. New heights we're gaining every day, or we ought to be. And then he's calling us upward. New heights we're gaining every day, upward. He wants us to be a spiritual people. We read in Psalm 10 and verse 18 about an individual who is called the man of the earth. Here's a man who is godless. Here's a man who's living for this world and nothing else. And we're not called to be a man of this earth. He leads us into the paths of righteousness, spiritual paths wherein is peace. He leads us forward. He leads us onward and forward and upward. He leads us homeward. You see, the life of the Christian is a pilgrimage. There's a lovely verse over in Jeremiah, or Jeremiah chapter 50. Uh, I think it's a verse 5. And it talks about our faces being thitherward towards Zion. We're on a pilgrimage. Our pilgrimage will soon be over. It'll soon pass. Followers of God, follow him home to the place of many mansions. You know, it doesn't matter where you go and when you go. You may go away on a holiday and it's great to go away, see new places. You relax, you enjoy yourself. But there comes that time, isn't it? Usually the day before and you start thinking about going home and there's no place like home. No place like home. And that's the way it is with our pilgrimage. We're going home to glory soon. Not just going to heaven, we're going home to glory soon to see the city bright. This is not the broad road that leads to destruction. Maybe you're on that road this morning. And you know why you're on that road? Because you're not saved. You're not in the family of God. You still have to own your father as the devil. 
There's a lot of Maxwells in the Clocker Valley. They've been there for generations. We're just blowing. And Andrew, my son, he, he works for a couple of farmers. And these Maxwells are farmer people. And every now and again, he bumps into somebody at the mart. And what's your name, Andrew Maxwell? Oh, whose son are you? Because I think he's one of the local brand of Maxwell's. And he has to say, well, my father's from Belfast. And uh, you hardly know one end of a cow to the other, to be honest. But that's not the point that I'm making this morning. Well, you need to be in the, the family of God this morning. You need to be one of God's people if you're hoping to go on to heaven because you're on a road as well. You're near the destiny too. The broad roads lead to destruction and many there be who go in there at. If you've got the herd mentality, it's leading you downward. Leading you downward. There's a narrow road that leads to life. And if you're a follower of God, you're on that narrow road that leads to life. And then thirdly here, and lastly, we have, not only do we have the description, not only the direction, but we have the dynamic here. What pushes this text forward? What is it based on? One little word, therefore. Be ye therefore. These words are a consequence. These words are the outworking of a logic, of a principle. What's the driving force, the dynamic behind it? You see, all, it's all the theology that goes before it. We have an application here in verse 5. These things being so, we could say, as a result of these things, be a follower of God as a dear child of his. This is more than a pep talk this morning. This is the outworking of a personal and individual faith in Christ. And it's very important that as a follower of God, that we, we realize why we do what we do. One of the key theological themes that goes before here, these words, is in chapter 1 and verse 4. And that is our election of God. This is a glorious doctrine this morning. It says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings according as, as a result of, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And this election of God this morning is as sovereign as regeneration. We are a reformed church this morning. We believe that election is unconditional. It is rooted 100% totally in the sovereign purpose of God. Mr. McShane taught us those words to sing, chosen not for good in me. Whether that goodness be works or foreseen faith, no, it is unconditional. And when we make our calling and our election sure, as well as when we have this assurance that we are in Christ, we have come to faith in him, for that's the fruit of election, then we are spurned or spurred on, I should say, rather, to be a follower of God. There are some people we meet, this maybe occasionally in, in, in debate and so on, and they say the doctrine of election has a deadening effect, that it, it cuts the vitals of all life. It leaves people sitting in pews doing nothing. It's not the case. Here we have the Apostle Paul. He has taught here this doctrine of election. Two chapters on, he says, therefore be a follower of God. Always remember that a lazy man, a lazy man will always find an excuse. And if he can't find one, he will manufacture one. But that doesn't mean that the doctrine is not true. A man has no right to use the doctrine of election for an excuse to do nothing. It is a spur to get up and to follow. And then there's another key doctrine here. What a tremendous doctrine it is. It is redemption by the blood. Redemption by the blood. Look there at chapter 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption 
through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The means whereby the chosen of God are actually redeemed. The cross is central to our entrance into the Christian life. It's central to our continuance therein. We cannot follow God this morning. We couldn't put one step in front of another without the power of the cross. And it's important that we keep near the cross, isn't it? We should look for it in Scripture. You read your Bibles, I trust you do, meditating upon it. You see it typified in the Old Testament. Psalm 53, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. We see it narrated in the Gospels. We see it explained in the Epistles. We should sing, we should memorize the great hymns of the faith that sent around the cross. And how blessed we are in our hymn book to have these great hymns of the blood. There is a fountain filled with blood. Jesus, keep me near the cross. My favorite hymn is that of Mr. Wesley. We will sing it tonight, O love divine. What hast thou done? The immortal God hath died for me. Listen to the application. Wesley made in that great hymn, then let us sit. Let us sit beneath his cross and gladly catch the healing stream. All things for him account but loss and give up all our hearts to him of nothing think or speak beside. My Lord, my love is crucified. We should use these passages of scripture, familiar say, ourselves with them and these hymns, we should use them in prayer. They are designed they are designed to stir up the soul. Let them do their work. It may bring an emotional response at times. You know, there's a great difference between emotion and emotionalism. Emotionalism is when you set out to stir the emotions. When you set out to rouse feelings. I, 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 I tend to avoid emotionalism. But we don't stop emotions, do we? And it might well be when you're reading the cross, there's those tears of joy, thankfulness. You see, love begets love, doesn't it? We love him because he first loved us. And talk to and listen to other Christians on the matter. We're followers of God as dear children. It's in the plural there. We should talk to one another about these things or the one thing that really matters. It's not that hard, is it, to encourage one another. And this following after God will show itself. It'll please God. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. It'll please the saints. It'll encourage them. It'll challenge the backsliders. The cold of heart. Those that are not really going on for God, they're stuck. They're stuck. No, oh, if you follow, you'll be a rebuke to the backslider. Sometimes that's what the backslider needs. He doesn't need his face ripped off him now. I don't mean it like that. But a little word of rebuke. A little word of rebuke. Faithful. Faithful, the Bible says, are the wounds of a friend. And of course, it'll evangelize the lost, won't it? It'll replace, it doesn't replace the lips. It's the word that brings people. But it'll greatly supplement what we're saying. Oh, may the Lord give us all grace this morning to be a follower of him, working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, to be a follower, a follower of God. I remember going to a baptismal service one night. A friend of the sons was getting baptized and he wanted to go and I was happy to go with him in the Penton Methodist Church. I was happy to go along and as the people were being baptized, they were singing a chorus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. May the Lord bless his word. We're going to close by singing 390 this morning. 390, dear Saviour, thou art mine. How sweet the thought to me. 390 and we'll stand to sing, remaining standing for the benediction. 390.
assurance this morning, a note of assurance and of praise. We bring our meeting to an end. Pray that you'll be with us the rest of this day. Help us to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Bring us back again, Lord, to the house of God even this night when the message of the gospel and all its rugged glory will be set forth. Bring in the unsaved especially tonight. We cannot leave them lost and known. We we'll want them over there. Part us now with your blessing and in your fear, the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Rest remain and abide with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.